Welcome back to the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies, where our series of episodes entitled After War, Before Peace are continuing. We began the series in November after the cessation of hostilities document was signed, and we are going to go through several weeks of episodes, not in any order of importance or priority, to try to tackle the various constituent mm -hmm parts of that uh, reality after war, before peace. And really, the title itself is even up for discussion. After war, yes, we're after war, but we're not at all in a time and a place that feels safe and secure for the people on the ground. And before peace, well, maybe, um, but only if these complex issues are tackled by specialists and politicians in good faith and in good time. Um, our task is to study these topics, and today we're going to talk about borders. Uh, borders, who determines them, how they are marked, what are the calculations that go into determining borders, and at what cost, political costs, to the parties involved. And in case this seems like an obvious sort of discussion, um, let me just tell you that the United States State Department has a whole department called International Boundaries and Sovereignties Issues. Or let me tell you that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, demarcation work between Belarus and Lithuania, not very large countries, not huge borders, began in 1996 and was completed in 2007. And the documentation added up to 50 volumes. In other words, this is as complex a topic as there is, and, um, and we'll get to it. We'll get to it with my colleague Emil Sanamyan, who is a Caucasus analyst, editor of the Institute's focus on Gharapakh portal, and my partner in trying to make sense of this amazingly complex world we are now living in. Emil, welcome. Our first guest is Levon Gevorkian, and Levon is a specialist in international law. He teaches that at the American University of Armenia, and he is involved in representing individual applicants before the European Court of Human Rights. Levon uh, is in Yerevan. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Levon, when you and I were talking off camera, you said, um, you said a couple of things that sound provocative to those who don't do the work you do. You said there is no such thing legally as internationally recognized borders. Well, at least in the case of uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan relations, definitely no, because uh, since there is, has been no uh, judicial settlement of the issue or through any bilateral negotiation process, uh, the term internationally recognized borders makes no no legal sense in this specific context. So you said two things. You said no judicial, uh, no adjudication on this matter and no bilateral agreement on this matter. So it, the, the, rec the border recognition could come through one of two ways. Well, uh, as anything, uh, let's say as anything within international law, starting with the creation binding the rules of international law and <clears throat> ending with the settlement of relations of uh, states, it is being created and settled, settled through the consent of states. That consent can manifest itself through negotiation process, which ends up ends up in a in a form of a treaty, or it can end up in a in a in a courtroom. So those are the, basically the two options. Of course, there can be also the treaty also can refer the settlement to a mixed commission, which is touching on the issue through, based on various principles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that is that is the basic rule. So, in the case of Armenia and Azerbaijan today, there are decisions being made, and and Emil can you can speak to this decisions being made about all sorts of things, about roads, about border crossings. Things are being decided in the absence of agreed upon borders. So, Emil, what are the immediate uh, obstacles, challenges, needs for this sort of border uh, demarcation 
uh, agreement, really, that doesn't exist. And we'll talk with Levon more about how to get there. But what is being impacted by the fact that this situation exists? Well, first and foremost, it's the people uh, who have been displaced uh, in the last uh, number of months, uh, two, three months. Uh, even since the November um, 10 agreement, uh, we've had uh, a large displacement uh, of Armenians, uh, both from areas uh, such as Karabajar, Kashata, uh, mm -hmm. areas adjacent to the district of Karabakh, and also in Sunik uh, province of Armenia. Um, and uh, that uh, is, was happening in, in a climate of uncertainty, lack of clarity. The government did not make it clear uh, where people could stay, where people could leave, had to leave, to what line, etc. Uh, that confusion still exists. For example, in a corridor con controlled by the Russian forces, there are two still Armenian semi-settled places there. Ahavno and Berzor. Uh, their statement, uh, their state, uh, status is not clear. So, so, so uh, if, we, if we divide these two, huh? if we divide the issue of borders that are relevant to Gharapal, its perimeter and its relationship to the surrounding areas and Armenia and Azerbaijan proper. So, if, Levon, if we talk first about the Sunik area before we get to what I imagine is the more complicated Gharapakh perimeter, um, maybe not, but today in the Sunik area, what kinds of decisions are being made? Who is making them? Um, do they have to be made in this hugely intense, difficult period? Well, as it comes to me, basically what we're dealing with is a situation where the borders, the delimitation and the demarcation is being unilaterally imposed by one of the parties. And Armenia- Open that up. What did, that, what did you just say, really? Yeah, that basically means that uh, there is an arbitrary determination of the boundaries by the Azerbaijani side, by the Azerbaijani forces. Uh, as it comes from the news, there seems to be some involvement by the Russian peacekeepers or <clears throat> Russian forces or whatever capacity they are being present in, in the region of Sunik. Uh, but at the end of the day, there seems to be zero involvement from the Armenian side, at least on the level of decision making. And <clears throat> the problematic aspect to this is that uh, the Armenian side is not is also not making statements, uh, at least to mitigate the potential legal effects of the ongoing process. So the Armenian side is not stating clearly for its people to know that basically what is happening is just happening for security reasons only. And th this, is not, this is not in any way an acknowledgement or acceptance of title over any, any piece of land that is currently occupied by the Azerbaijani forces. Okay, we're gonna repeat that. What you're saying is that there are immediate issues that need to be resolved, where the cattle graze, where the uh, residents travel. Um, and in order to determine those immediate on the ground issues, there are decisions that have to be made about where the border is. You're saying there is a difference between saying we're making these decisions now for this immediate security and everyday living purposes this is not an internationally negotiated boundary between two states. Exactly, that is a, that is a position that the government needs to be ex extremely clear and to make a clear statement for the people. But at the end of the day, it seems to be preoccupied with, um, let's say, populist rhetoric, which is not helping it in any way, at least not helping the, the nation in any way and the state in any way, because references to legislation adopted by the previous previous uh, governments or previous na national assembly or claims that we're just abiding with the internationally recognized borders they are definitely not helping the the best interests of the republic of armenia they may be helping the the uh, stance of the political ruling party but not more than that um Emil, do you want to open up what, what Levon is referring to, the, the fact that these political uh, statements are made for political purposes, but really end up having all sorts of other 
ramifications, historic, political. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the flow of uh, sort of justifications uh, has been uh, both uh, per persistent and random on the part of the Armenian government. But uh, what I would like to uh, talk about is that, yes, there is a clearly uh, a, a reference line uh, between uh, the province of Sunik and what the Armenian government previously thought of as Kashatah district of Artsakh. There is that reference line that comes from the, the Soviet period, but there's also the practice in and other parts of Armenia. it comes from the Armenian Soviet period. period. These are administrative divisions that existed in the Soviet right. period. Right. Uh, but there is a, also practice on Armenian Azerbaijani border, other areas, Nakhchivan, Tavush, um, where basically you have uh, many areas that uh, used to be administratively Armenian, but controlled by Azerbaijan, and uh, also administratively Azerbaijani controlled by Armenia. So if uh, this is happening in Sunik, will it transpire also in the other areas? And if not, why not? Uh, there is not that clarity. And I'm not sure if uh, anybody uh, has that clarity. There, like uh, Leon just mentioned, there is uh, uh, basically demands by uh, the other side and the Armenian uh, local population and, uh, and the officials are complying. So there are two sets of issues here. One is that some parts of Armenia were adjacent to Azerbaijani territories that were under Armenian control. And so there, there are decisions to make. There are parts of Armenia that are, in fact, bordering Azerbaijan and have been now for 30 years. And there, the decision making is different. And then finally, of course, there's Ghadapar itself with its now reconstituted administrative borders? Uh, there's no border. Uh, there is a, a line uh, that is on the map of the Russian Defense Ministry, and there is uh, uh, the notion of uh, area of responsibility of the Russian peacekeepers. Uh, but as we saw in the case of uh, Khzabert and uh, Hintaher, this area in the south of Karabakh, uh, part of Hadrut district, that were controlled by Armenian forces <coughs> and were Armenian populated areas inside uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh autonomy, uh, they were evacuated uh, in the middle of December. Uh, uh, they were captured by Azerbaijan, and as a matter of fact, over 60 uh, people were taken prisoner as a result of that, uh, that de development. Uh, so uh, th there's no guarantee that another part of that map of uh, Russian peacekeeping responsibility would be altered in some way and, you know, sort of handed over. Uh, or changed in some other way that would cause additional imprisonments, additional uh, you know, damage. To people. So, Levon, who who is speaking with whom? At what level are these discussions taking place? At what levels of seniority? Um, is it Armenians speaking with Azerbaijanis? Is it always with the Russian mediation? How is this actually happening on the ground? Well, it's actually very, very difficult to tell from the public inf from the information that is publicly available, because the public publicly available information tells us about the negotiations and the meetings that are happening in Moscow and in uh, other places where these three lateral meetings are happening. And it seems to uh, seems to be the case that the meetings are happening on the highest level. Uh, there is also the statement which was signed in Moscow and allegedly. There is going to be created a commission by the representatives of the uh, the deputy prime ministers of the of the three nations, and it's also unclear whether this commission is going to touch upon only issues of uh, transit only, but but whether it's going to touch also on, upon issues of boundary determination. It's fairly fairly difficult to tell. Is this? strictly a political process right now? Or is there also a legal process taking place? Well, uh, he, there, here's the thing. Uh, if we're talking about delimitation and demarcation, uh, the, the rules for determination of boundaries are definitely uh, legal, legal rules, which are based in the practice of states and in customary and treaty law. Uh, whether the process that is happening right now is taking into consideration those rules, it's very hard to tell. It's obvious that the process is taking into consideration the rules as those uh, are interpreted by Azerbaijan. And Azerbaijan has been very, uh, very um, obvious in uh, at least for two decades, starting from 2008, 
Azerbaijan has uh, has has been stating its position on the demarcation and the limitation issues, as, as well as the um, uh, the question of its title over the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh in a very very precise manner through various uh, letters to the United Nations, where the Azerbaijan Azerbaijani government has persistently claimed that they want to rely on the rule of continuity of Soviet borders. Uh, whether that rule has basis in public international law, that's another thing to debate. I would argue strongly that there is no binding rule that would, let's say, obligate the Republic of Armenia to be bound by the, by the Soviet boundaries as those were drawn at the moment of the collapse of the Soviet Union, at least at least let me put it in this way. Uh, the claim of Azerbaijan is basically uh, substantiated by reference to practice of period of decolonization, 19th century Latin America, decolonization process in, in Africa, which has mm -hmm. hardly anything to do with the, with the process of collapse of uh, federal states. Uh, but Armenia has been extremely silent, extremely silent in arguing against all these all these claims from from the side of Azerbaijan, at least at least until recently, uh, I believe there was a there was one response in 2019 uh, where Armenia, uh, in a letter to the United Nations, amongst many many other topics pertaining to its relations with Azerbaijan, also claims that this rule, which in Latin is coined "utiposidetis," is not applicable to the situation that we have, but. Armenia has been silent for, for more than a decade, and it's basically prime time. Uh, it, it's actually late right now, but at least now Armenia has to formulate a certain stance on the issue. Uh, as a matter of fact, as it has to formulate a stance on many other issues of its exactly. foreign relations, which it has never done for decades. So, Emil, you and I have talked about this, and we kind of look at it kind of differently in that that this document that was signed in November is what it is. And we can either look at this as complete capitulation and Armenia has no cards to play and this is how now this bilateral relationship will go forward, or that that document says what it does about the things that it addresses. And that was our first episode of this uh, After War Before Peace when I spoke with the former co-chair of U.S. co-chair of the Minsk Group, Stephen Mann, and we went through the lines one by one. This is what it means and this is what it doesn't. Is it not fair to say that there is a perception issue, an understanding issue here, where the Armenian leadership can, in fact, give themselves the right to address issues that are not in that document and that remain in their hand to resolve? Am I being too optimistic? Is that not, in fact, a possibility here? The regulation, the, as the, the other former ambassador, uh, Harry Gilmore, uh, said, uh, Armenia has many problems, or, uh, you know, huge. Uh, and uh, it's never been the, uh, true uh, as, as it is right now. I don't think Armenia was as That's what you're deep quoting hole. Harry Gilmore for, that we have huge problems? <laughs> <laughs> as deep hole as it was in the early 90s. I mean, you know. Obviously, there were some issues there as well. But um, uh, as far as the document, I mean, we've, we've had problems with documents implementation to begin with. Uh, but the, also uh, been... the understanding of the document, <laughs> comprehending what is there and what is not and that can still be played. Yes, absolutely. I mean, from, from the beginning, it was clear that the document made no mention of Armenian controlled portions of what used to be Soviet era Kubatli and Zangilan districts that provided uh, sufficient sort of security cover around Armenia's fourth largest town of Kapan. And, uh, and even though there was no mention of that in the, in the agreement, the Armenian forces still were told to pull out from uh, from the heights around Kapan. And uh, now uh, Kapan is basically, uh, you know, uh, a couple hundred meters from the line of contact. Yeah. So uh, there, is a, uh, there is a whole range of issues that has not been deployed. There's a whole range of arguments that have not been deployed uh, or actions that have not been deployed, yes. Levon, if you want to add anything, please do. We're going to talk to uh, Gela Merabishvili soon uh, about other examples of this. But, but given the situation on the ground where you are, is this something that is uh, 
that anyone other than, than the elites, the leadership, can deal with? Or is this really a matter of waiting to see what Armenia's de facto leadership does? Well, unfortunately, as any, any process on the public international law, this is being negotiated and can be moved forward only by the by the decision maker. So that is going to be the prime minister, that is going to be the minister of foreign affairs. Uh, if we're talking about any any uh, sort of an elite within the country, if there is any, of course, uh, and hopefully there is, uh, the best thing that can be done is to put the pressure and to explain, uh, to, to, to bring it to these people that there are basically legal, legal grounds to claim that the process can be can be drawn in a very dif uh, dr driven in a different direction, and that the interests, the best interests of the Republic of Armenia, can be maintained. Uh, as a pro preliminary consideration, the, the the least thing that they can do is at least avoid from any rhetoric that is going to contribute to the to the uh, efforts of the Republic of Azerbaijan, and at least not block the opportunity for the future generations to raise these legal issues. Because, as I said, uh, the, the statements that are being made by the prime minister and uh, many of the representatives of the ruling party seems to adopt that rhetoric, that narrative that hadn't been, had been propagated by the Republic of Azerbaijan for decades, internationally recognized borders. The thing that, I, uh, that we're talking about during the uh, call prior to this uh, interview there is there, there is no such thing or there is no such presumption that what that when states become parties to the united nations or to any international or, organization as a matter of fact they kind of have their title or territory registered in some way as it is being done in a cadastre for for private ownership that is not the way that public international law works and the statement internationally recognized borders which is made has been made like from, from, and propagated by media and Azerbaijan for decades uh, by alleging to, by re reference to the four security council resolutions that have been also adopted in the context of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, where Nagorno-Karabakh too is being referred to as a, as a territory of, uh, 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 of Azerbaijan. There's one basic thing to understand. Security council is not a body with a mandate to determine title of a territory. It's a, it's a body with a mandate to determine security and um, with a mandate of maintenance of peace and security. If there is a wording within those Security Council resolutions that says one piece of land belongs to one state and another piece of land belongs to another state, it's just a political stance of the states that ha have voted in favor of those Security Council resolutions. It's not a binding determination under public international law. And coming back to what I was saying earlier, Absent any judicial determination, absent any, 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 any treaty or any political binding process that has uh, finally uh, determined the boundary between the two states, the, the wording international recognized makes no sense under public international law whatsoever. Thank you, Levon. Uh, Levon Gevorkian, attorney, international Thank you. law. And... Uh, Thank you for helping us understand the complexities. I feel like that's all I keep repeating is complexities, but really it really is. And this isn't just a matter that is Republic of Armenia relevant, but at the end of the day, if it is peace that we're going to talk about, then the situation on the ground has to be equitable and sustainable. And for that to happen, each of these complex pieces has to be resolved wisely. Our second guest on this episode of After War, Before Peace is Gela Merabishvili, a recent graduate of Virginia Tech with a doctorate in political geography, which after all is what borders are. They're the geographic expression of political ambitions. Uh, with Gela, we're going to speak about how borders are defined, identified, marked in regular non-combatant relations. We spoke the other day with Levon Gevorkian from Yerevan about the current situation between Armenia and Azerbaijan and this post-combatant, current combatant situation. And we want to try to get with Gela an understanding of the processes 
in the region, in the post-Soviet space. We're going to speak with him about how all of this transpired in Georgia. Gela, welcome. Thank you, Salvi. It's great to be with you. Gela, you're going to help us, please, to try to understand how interstate borders are recognized and agreed upon, and also how the borders with and within disputed territories are identified, and Georgia has both. So first, yeah. let's talk about Georgia's border with its neighbors, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Russia, and Turkey. Uh, here's a map that shows all of Georgia's state borders with all of its neighbors, as well as its borders with the two disputed territories uh, within what Georgia considers its own sovereign state, that is Abkhazia in green and South Ossetia in pink. So let's please start, Gela, the border demarcation and delimitation process between Georgia and Russia, Georgia and Turkey. How, how does that go? How long has it been going on? Is it going on? And is it uh, acrimonious or is it a normal process? Um, so it started very soon after Georgia gained independence after Soviet Union in early 90s. And with Turkey, it went really smoothly. And uh, within a couple of years, um, the whole border length was uh, delimited and demarcated. Uh, but with Russia, it didn't happen so. It lasted, uh, it continued for uh, a much longer time. And uh, by 2008, when the two countries, Georgia and Russia, had war, uh, by that time, about one third of the border had been delimited. Since that war, uh, the delimitation process has stopped between these two countries because there is a major obstacle uh, in understanding where the border lies, it's, it's concerned with South Ossetia and Abkhazia because Russia recognizes these two uh, territories as separate republics, while Georgia considers it, uh, these territories as uh, its own uh, regions. Is there a problem with the state borders outside of the Abkhazia-South Ossetia situation? Uh, outside of uh, these two territories, there are minor problems. It just, uh, the sides decided to stop in 2008 and they didn't get to those relatively minor issues uh, because there's this major, major issue. And does that create a problem in everyday life? Uh, in everyday life, it probably doesn't uh, create a lot of problem because the main border between the between Russia and Georgia, it goes through the Caucasian mountainous range. So it's not that populated area, it's very high mountains. Uh, but um, uh, so, and people don't really move in those areas that much. There are, uh, there is one uh, crossing point in Ghazbegi where uh, the, most of the movement occurs and there everything is fine. Uh, it's just in other areas in these high mountains, uh, two thirds of this length is not yet delimited, but I don't think that it really affects everyday life of the local population because they don't really live very, very in very proximity of the of the actual border line. Emil, do we want to I go further a, with this? That's that's a big difference between uh, the types of borders that both Georgia and Armenia have. On one hand, there are borders that have been established over the past Soviet period since the early 20s. In the case of Armenia, that's also Turkey and uh, Iran. And in the case of uh, Georgia, it's, it's Turkey. And there, you know, the borders were uh, demarcated in the, in the Soviet period. So there may, may have been some minor adjustments. But the issue comes in is when you have administrative borders within the Soviet Union, that had to be delimited and demarcated. Uh, and uh, like Gila said, issues with Georgia and Armenia, Georgia and Azerbaijan are fairly minor. And, uh, you know, there's been occasional debates and discussions, but uh, they don't uh, come into a uh, major uh, kind of dispute unless there is an actual dispute over territory, as the case with uh, applies in South Ossetia and the case of Karabakh mm -hmm. between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So what about Georgia and Azerbaijan, Gela, that border? So Georgia, uh, yeah, Georgia and Azerbaijan, uh, and it's quite similar to uh, Georgia and Armenia delimitation process in that, uh, that uh, 
in both cases, about two thirds of the border has been delimited and uh, the process is ongoing. Uh, uh, there are no major obstacles to the process, although recently in the last two years, there was uh, one, uh, I would say in geographically minor, but then it became somewhat symbolically important issue with Azerbaijan uh, of, a, uh, of a small section of a border in a Gareji area. Uh, where there is a um, Christian monastery complex. So for Georgians, and as far as I understand, for Azerbaijanis as well, this is an a, a important cultural place. And uh, both sides uh, consider... Uh, so there is a difference in terms of few hundred meters, but because these few hundred meters will decide where the actual buildings of those monasteries will end up, uh, this is a very important issue, and uh, uh, now it's, it has become a quite uh, an important geopolitical uh, topic. At least within Georgia, this, this has become a, uh, an issue of uh, everyday politics, and people pay attention to it. Even going so far as to accuse the officials in charge of the process of treason. Um, Talk, exactly. A, yeah. t talk a little more about that process and how it can finally be resolved or adjudicated, because I suspect that, you know, the Armenian-Azerbaijani relationship is going to have many of those issues. Uh, that process usually involves uh, going through old maps, when usually Soviet maps, when uh, uh, this border between... Uh, then Soviet Republic of Georgia and, and Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan was uh, created, and then uh, agreeing which which side, which part goes to which. But uh, right now, it has I think it has gone beyond the mere technical work, and it should involve higher political figures, uh, because uh, at the moment, uh, what what's what a some technical expert might consider a simple uh, section, small section of a land of few hundred meters or few tens of meters, uh, it might actually become a very important nationalist cause within each country. And uh, politicians can be blamed for uh, selling off uh, ancient Georgian or ancient Azerbaijani land. Uh, so this is important. So how the places become symbolically important for the for the from nationalist point of view. There's no third party yeah, adjudication. The... Uh, so far, no. So far, it's simply it's a matter between Azerbaijan and Georgia. But if they cannot agree, then it could be educate, educated <laughs> in in uh, yeah educated in um, uh, on international form. Uh, one thing I was going to add is that in addition to the symbolic significance of that uh, monastery complex, it sits on a hill and uh, it uh, provides also a military uh, value in terms of whoever sits on that hill has a view of, uh, of that valley stretching towards uh, Georgia-Armenia border, uh, along georgia Azerbaijani border. And uh, what we learned in the last uh, couple of years is that there's also a segment of uh, georgian Azerbaijani border just across into Georgia. Uh, that is actually mined by the Azerbaijani side, just in case, I guess, they were worried about Armenia possibly using that way to get into Azerbaijan mm -hmm. or something like that. But uh, there was a military aspect to, uh, to this dispute mm -hmm. as well. So, um, South Ossetia, internal borders that are disputed. Um, how, how is that managed? So at the moment, um, this uh, the new shape of the border uh, came after 2008 war. And it is managed by Georgians from the Georgian side. And, and But there is also European involvement here. There is European Union monitoring mission, which initially should have controlled the whole conflict zone on both sides of the boundary. Uh, but South Ossetian and Russian sides do not allow EUMM monitoring mission on on the on the other side. So at the moment they are con they are monitoring from the Georgian controlled side. On the other side, it's 
Russians and Ossetian uh, border forces, uh, Russian FSB forces that are uh, controlling the line and making sure that there is no uh, mobility between the territories. The the 2008 uh, uh, adjustment differs yes. from what it was before when the separatism process just began? Yes. Uh, so the this boundary line uh, changed a lot in the last three decades. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, it emerged as a conflict zone. And uh, there were um, OSC, there was an OSC mission uh, who controlled this con conflict zone, but uh, there was no hard border at the time. In the 90s, in, in, in uh, early to mid 2000s, there was no hard border. People could easily move from one side to another. There was this very huge informal market, uh, Ergeneti market, which attracted lots of people from North Caucasus, from South Caucasus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkey. And it was a very uh, good place to trade and uh, make informal links and make money. Uh, this all ended in 2008 uh, with that war. And after the war, uh, South Ossetian and Russian sides, they signed an agreement so that Russians would be allowed by South Ossetian de facto government that uh, Russian FSB would control the border. And since then, little by little, uh, Russians and South Ossetians started to build the actual physical barriers, uh, which today we call borderization. Uh, but uh, Georgian side generally doesn't refer to this line as uh, as border because the word border associ is associated with international boundaries and international borders. And from Georgian point of view, this is a Russian occupation line. This is how generally Georgians refer to this line. EUMM, the EU's monitoring mission, usually refers to it not as border, but as administrative boundary line or ABL. So, so not to antagonize with the Georgian way of looking at it, but also um, not to call it occupation line. Yeah. Uh, but South Ossetian and Russian side call it a state border. Emil, before we end this segment, do you want to draw the Gharapov parallels? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, I think there is an interesting uh, aspect here where it, it clear that it's, it's clear that the Russian government is very faithful to the administrative lines, autonomous administrative lines. Uh, From the their Soviet main, period. Main, re, yeah, their main reference point uh, for their uh, decision where the lines are, not ethnic base or any other basis. Sometimes you know geography doesn't make sense, but the line is going through there, so that's what it is. Just like, uh, say, if we look back in the early 20th century when the British uh, were sort of adjudicating uh, disputes at the end of World War One in the Caucasus, and their references were reference lines were uh, to you know had to do with the governor governorate borders between you know Yelisavetopol governorate and uh, Erevan governorate and Tiflis governorate. So that was the main reference point, even though you know obviously there were ethnic and geographic challenges there as well. So the, the parallels are interesting. Um, in other episodes, we will dive deeper into what really happens across those borders, uh, what happens every day, what the everyday implications are for the people living there, and of course, for those who govern both the disputed territory, South Ossetia in this case, and the Georgian government, and to draw parallels for uh, the Gharapakh situation, especially as it continues to unfold in unpredictable ways. Um, I want to thank Gela Merabishvili, who joined us today, and Levon uh, Gevorkian, who joined us a few days ago, both of them, to speak about this really complicated issue of borders, and both as they serve a functional purpose today and as they will come to represent interstate borders in the future. Emil Sanamian, of course, thank you. And thank you all for following After War Before Peace. And join us again as we try to explore other folds in this multifaceted challenge. And continue to follow all of the work that we do at the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies on YouTube, on all of the podcast channels.